inches right along the Western Front. Men who, until then, had been doing their best to slaughter each other, fell under some kind of extraordinary spell. It was as if the angels had come down and gently sprinkled the Christmas spirit on German and British soldiers alike. The firing stopped, a great silence fell, and then, slowly, a miracle occurred. It was a Christmas card, Christmas Eve. There was a white, beautiful moonlight, frost on the ground, almost white everywhere. And round about, I think about seven or eight or in the evening, we were this singing, a lot of commotion, and we saw some lights. I don't know what they were, some lights. And later, we heard them singing, still a silent night, still a night, silent night. I shall never forget it. It's one of the highlights of my life, absolutely, to see them. I thought, what a beautiful tune. And all of a sudden, lights appeared all along the German trench. And I thought, well, that's a funny thing. And I, then the Germans started singing, Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. And uh, I, I woke up, with all the other sentries did the same thing, all woke up the other people to come along and see this, what on earth's going on? <laughs> they finished their carol. We applauded them, and then we thought we we must retaliate in some way. So we we replied with the first Noel, and it went on for days. Historian Malcolm Brown from the Imperial War Museum is here now, along with Taft Gillingham, who actually spent one Christmas in a trench on the Western Front with a group of mates to gain an insight of what it must have been like for the men who were crouching there 90 years ago and more. Welcome both. Um, let's talk to you first of all as the historian about this extraordinary episode. This is a documentary going out tonight, which, uh, which will be going into it in more detail. But it really did happen. It's, this isn't a myth um, for, from World War I. It really no, happened. No, absolutely it did happen. Yeah. Silence fell on Christmas Eve. After all, think of it, there had been a lot of fierce fighting, but it had all settled down. People were in trenches. Mm. And once you're in trenches and only about a couple of hundred yards or even less away, you begin mm. to be interested in what's happening on the other side. Mm. And in the German trenches, there were a lot of reservists who had been working in London and had come out there, and they wanted to exercise their English, so they were shouting across one to the other. Mm -hmm. And there was a joke going around, if on the British side you shouted, waiter, half the Germans would pop up and say, yes, sir, <laughs> you see. <laughs> and, they, you know, they, they were, people <laughs> would uh, say, uh, there's a regiment opposite, I recognise it. A German shouted out uh, when he saw a Warwickshire regiment opposite, like Tafsey, his yeah. is a Warwickshire regiment, saying, I've got a, a, a wife and six children in Birmingham. And somebody shouts back and says, keep your head down, or there'll be a widow and six orphans in Birmingham. Ah, ah. So, Gosh, you see, and then you see, the thing was, they think there was a great conspiracy on the both nations' part mm -hmm. to send presents to the front. Do you know, um, there were... Uh, four and a half, uh, two and a half million letters and cards sent to the front, and two and a half million, uh, four hundred thousand parcels sent to the front mm -hmm. on the British side, similarly on the German side, and the Germans also sent Christmas trees. Every unit had a Christmas tree, mm. down to the U-boats as well. So, so they what were they really going to do with them? So they were... Attack each other with Christmas trees, or yeah. put them on the edge of the parapet, put lights on them? And, and, take a and take a holiday yeah, from the war. Lovely. I mean, it was reported in the British media at the time. I mean, we've got this picture from the front page of the Daily Mirror uh, a couple of days after, after the, the football game. Look at that. I mean, that's, a, that's an authentic picture of German and English soldiers at the height of war fraternising. It must have, must have driven the, 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 the brass, top brass behind well, the lines. Look, the curious thing, it didn't. Didn't it? Uh, it some were, uh, were pretty angry because it wasn't exactly good behaviour. But, you see, the thing was, the conditions were so bad. Mm. Uh, the, the trenches were so awful that when the truce went on for a day or so, people began to think there's a chance here to do something about it. So, in fact, uh, there was a sort of mutual uh, arrangement whereby you could work on your trenches, the Germans could work on theirs. And you wouldn't shoot each other. And they didn't shoot. I interviewed an old boy now long dead who said after Christmas um, they were working on their trenches and their tools weren't very good. They looked across, the Germans are doing rather better. So they said, let's go across and borrow a few tools. So they went across and the Germans said, OK, have some tools. Gee. It's and extraordinary, you know, isn't it? It's you know, so they did. They, you see, the humanity. Uh, 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 and the, uh, also, you see, the common culture of Christmas. Mm. You've got two nations loving Christmas. Mm. The Germans more or less took the, 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 the started off because they always begin their Christmas on Christmas Eve. Mm. You okay. see, what they were doing there were, uh, in this, the, the, the film we just saw, they were starting Christmas. Well, look, before, we, a, before well, we look at some of the wonderful things that Taft's brought, let's have a look at uh, tonight's documentary, which is going out um, on, uh, on BBC Two at nine o'clock, um, uh, called uh, The Christmas Truce. And 
this is actually that the, 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 they started playing the British and, and Germans. They started playing a game of football, on and this the was the happening next day, the, next, the day. next day on Christmas okay. Day, and this was happening all the way across the front. Mm. Let's have a look. Everywhere this Christmas afternoon, events are taking on a life of their own. And someone in a Lancashire regiment must have been a clairvoyant because he's brought the perfect accessory for a day off at the front, a football. Cheese, man, cheese! <laughs> the same scene is repeated in a dozen places with tin cans, rolled up sandbags, whatever can be found. With teams of 60 aside and less than perfect pitches, scores like the ball disappear in the melee. Although one game did produce a familiar result. 3-2 to the Germans. And just before we do look at this memorabilia here, um, here's a letter from the Imperial War Museum that they've allowed us to show, um, sent by a guy called Lieutenant, uh, Second Lieutenant Dugan Chater to his mother on Christmas Day 1914, the day that football game happened. He starts by telling her about the game and how amazing it all was, and then he goes on to say this. We had another parlay with the Germans in the middle. We exchanged cigarettes and autographs, and some people took photos. I don't know how long it will go on for. I believe it was supposed to stop yesterday, but we can hear no firing from across the front today, except a little distant shelling. We are, at any rate, having another truce on New Year's Day, as the Germans want to know how the photos came out. <laughs> Isn't that? It's heartbreaking, It's actually. heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because, you know, the, the carnage, apart from those truces, was terrible. Show us what you've brought from your... It's not, your society kind of... You, you, you're all amateur historians and, ri and writers and keen, but yes. you're not an, a reenactment no. society. No, no. no. Um, the khaki chums are, are very unusual. They're actually unique, I would think. They're certainly not a reenactment group. The chums are a group of uh, authors, collectors, historians, experts in all sort of dif different aspects of British mm. military right, history. OK. This so, German, captured German helmet yeah. got it. I thought that was going to be steel, but it's, is it cardboard? Uh, no, it's leather. That wouldn't yeah. be much good yeah. in, a, in a firefight, would it? No, no, not at all. But there again, neither were soft peak caps either. So, so, they, didn't, all... they, so they didn't have tin hats at no, first? Not until 1916. That's right. No. No. That's oh, it. Right. Yeah. Yes, okay. at this stage. And I mean, the, this was the, the sort of pinnacle of souvenir hunting, you know. Absolutely. That, that, uh, that every British Helmet. soldier was after. And what would they get? What would they get from... Um, they got presents, didn't yes, they? From, yeah. from the royal family. Um, Princess Mary, uh, the, uh, obviously the King and Queen's daughter, was very keen as early as October 1914. She'd come up with the idea uh, that every single soldier and sailor should have a Christmas gift. And this whole scheme uh, with these little brass tins, the smokers all had cigarettes and tobacco, and every single cigarette actually had a monogram on it with the M on it. Um, there were pipes, there were tinder lighters. The non-smokers had writing sets and sweets. Uh, it was a phenomenal... And postcards uh, to send home with the, with the, with the, that, with the King and Queen on. Yeah, King yeah. and Queen sent them as well. Uh, and a little 1914 Christmas card as well that, that oh, came fantastic. with it. Oh. A phenomenal now, e we, effort. If we just run some archive again from the Imperial War Museum, uh, this is what they drifted back into within, within just a few days. It was all back on again. The whole thing collapsed. Was that because of pressure from, from behind the lines? Was that because was that of political pressure saying, guys, we're in a war here, we're not meant to be shaking hands and having uh, I mean, it, my own view of it is that the 1914 truce, the, the British army was still predominantly pre-war regular soldiers, professionals. Yeah. To them it was business. They would just as happily have gone and fought the French or the Belgians gotcha. or anybody else. Yeah. And as professional soldiers, I think that they were quite capable of saying, actually, I'm going to take a day out of this, yeah. a couple of days off, and then answer. we're capable of going back and carrying so on. I mean, don't forget that uh, ten departments of France have been invaded and were occupied by the Germans, most of Belgium. Mm. So if they did have a nice little arrangement at Christmas, it, it wasn't a serious business to go on and on. No. I mean, many of them dreamed how nice it would be to sort of shake hands and go home, but it just wasn't possible. Well, the business had to be finished. I must, I must do this. This is, a, this is yours. This is a, a, a Leonfield. This is it what is. my granddad would have had, and many yes. people's granddads would have had. And I remember him telling me a story of, of when he was in, in combat and the Germans were coming in wave after wave, and he was, him and his men were doing this all the time, doing the bolt, doing yep. the bolt, checking the, the magazine, putting it back in. And when the attack was over that they just repelled it their hands were oh, yeah. from this yeah. bolt were yeah. red Later. raw yeah. and blistered because yeah. of the heat of the bolt yeah. the, the barrel rifle had got yes. so hot and that's what my granddad had yeah oh, they're fantastic i mean it, that really is probably the pinnacle of british arms manufacturing yeah. for its day yeah they've never built anything better before or since well bbc2 nine o'clock tonight thank you both very much indeed for coming and uh, fascinating much. story beautifully told thank and you somehow, <laughs> okay. and somehow terribly heartwarming and uplifting but somehow terribly oh, sad yes, isn't it? It is, terribly yeah, sad it is. that it couldn't last or completely for, for you know for the rest of the war really um but it's always worth now 
Still staying on Christmas, it's always worth raising your glass during Christmas lunch to toast all those dedicated people who work. <laughs>